Hello and welcome to Finextra TV. I'm Hannah Wallace and joining me today is Yogesh Patel, CTO of Outsea and we're talking about the new PSD3 regulation and the impact this is having on 3DS. Yogesh, Hi, thank you very much for joining us. It's good to have you on. Good to be on board. So this is a really interesting topic and I know there have been some interesting developments um, around PSD3. Uh, so I'm interested to hear uh, how those changes have had an impact on 3DS and what you think should be front of mind for issuers at this time as well? So it's a great question to start with, uh, and I would say that uh, you know before we start, um, it's interesting to call out that you know post pandemic we've seen a significant transformational shift in the payments landscape at a global scale. Obviously, UK is leading the front, especially when it comes to the regulatory reforms. And you can see that uh, when you look at how the story of PSD3 is unfolding. And when you zoom into that, it's really, PSD3 is really an evolution to uh, PSD2, mm -hmm. but it is taking us one step closer to the world of open finance. Now, in terms of uh, the regulatory changes that could potentially have a direct or indirect impact on uh, 3DS, uh, I would say they're mainly categorized into uh, changes related to security and fraud, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to um, rollouts like dynamic linking, um, liability shifts. Uh, they also get categorized into data sharing, so having a robust data sharing protocol so that information between different financial institutions can be safely transmitted in a secure and privacy preserving manner. And lastly, I would think that, you know, the reinforcement of uh, strong customer authentication. And we've already seen that, you know, um, latest version of PSD2 included some of that. So I can briefly talk about this because it's been the most impactful so far. Um, you know, PSD3 really is aiming to improve upon the, the sort of regulation sets by PSD2 in terms of uh, user experience. And some of the proposals that's already been out and um, PSD3 is going to extend on that. It's in the space of, um, you know, user experience, but in particular, how it impacts the strong customer authentication exemption. So the latest proposal has been that, um, you know, extending the limit of strong customer authentication exemption um, window from 90 days to 180 days. Now, there's a welcoming news for customers like yourself and, and myself. And, you know, instead of me now resetting my password every 90 days, because I don't <laughs> remember the password, I'll be doing it every 180 days. But it's still been a, a useful change. But it's also been helping the merchants as well as the issuers in terms of uh, reducing that abandonment rates that we've seen at the checkouts uh, as a direct result of this, uh, of this rule. Now, when you say, or at least when you look at the, um, you know, the changes um, that uh, can optimize the issuer's um, intervention rates and capabilities, uh, I would first start with saying issuers should focus or keep a close eye out on uh, the regulations that are upcoming with PSD3 and trying to stay um, on board. Mm -hmm. in a sense that trying to start planning for um, the changes that they could be coming as part of either a system change or a process change. The draft versions will be out by end of this year and then you know there'll be a consultation period and we're looking to have a rollout in two years so in 2026 um, where we should be able to ready. But just taking a more slightly broader perspective towards you know, how we can better define the interventions. I would mm -hmm. say that you know, issuers could adopt a unified uh, risk-based authentication mm -hmm. strategies that can really streamline um, the authentication experience um, regardless of the channel that the customer is interacting with. This could really help with uh, improving customer experience and satisfaction, but also help combat those um, complex fraud MOs that we've seen in the industry around uh, authorized push payment fraud. Um, lastly, I would uh, call out that uh, data science and AI uh, plays a vital role it definitely helps with uh, you know, keeping your customer satisfaction at a certain level, uh, but it also helps with building trust as it ensures that those interventions are timely, are precise, and has a minimum uh, you know, friction to it. 
So I think in a nutshell, you know, PSD3 is definitely a step closer in terms of uh, making the payments world more uh, safer mm -hmm. and more customer centric. And uh, you know, I would encourage all the issuers to uh, get involved with the, with the changes, um, start to implement those changes as soon as they know that to stay competitive. Well, thank you very much for the update, bringing us up to date there. And we'll talk more about AI and the role of data science later on. But I'm interested to hear more about um, the rollout from Visa and MasterCard uh, and their protocol updates. What have been some of the developments uh, in that space as well? Yeah, so you know, we, we talked about earlier that um, you know, digital payments landscape is, is ever evolving. Now, MVCO, um, who owns the, the 3DS standards and protocols and Visa and MasterCards are a huge contributor to that, are also rolling out um, in, in a changes that's going to be really transformative when it comes to us transacting in a digital world. Now, you know, there are too, too much changes to go through, but if I just highlight some of the, some of the key ones, I would say that they're really focused on uh, frictionless uh, flows. So for example, uh, and this is based on what they call trusted list. So if you are deemed as a, a, a you know, trusted user, if you are deemed as a trusted merchant, a trusted acquirer, a trusted issuer, you can really streamline the user experience uh, when it comes to having a frictionless experience uh, mm -hmm. in terms of authentication. Um, there's a lot of work being ongoing in the in authentication challenge flows as well when it comes to MVCO. Um, especially they are introducing a set of new out-of-band authenticators uh, that are going to be more safer and more user-friendly. Now, you wouldn't believe, Hannah, that when you look at outside of uh, UK and Europe, um, you'd see that uh, SMS uh, is still used as a primary means to authenticate individuals over an OTP. Now, you know, we all know the sort of security vulnerabilities associated with uh, SMS. And this is where, uh, you know, MBCO is going one step further in terms of introducing a set of other authenticators. Uh, one of the most notable change that I came across recently is uh, Weezer is introducing uh, FIDO as an authenticator under uh, the what they call you know delegated authentication framework initiative or aka click to pay uh, this would really going to help in terms of um, user experience and providing a more secure infrastructure around how to be authenticate uh, users in a safer manner um, i'd also worth calling out that uh, in a version 2.3 mm. which is the latest 3ds version brought a lot of changes around the set of uh, data elements that can be enriched as part of the transactions, which means that we can now have those data elements come into uh, some like ACS provider like Outseer to really have that pass through our machine learning model so that you know, we can get more accurate fraud detection capabilities on the back of that. And the success of this was, t was such a, to a such a great extent that now uh, Visa and MasterCard are rolling out another an initiative called Bridging Message Extension, which means that these protocols and these data elements will be now supported by an older versions of um, 3DS uh, protocols. So it will now be available in version 2.2 and 2.1. So as you can see that these changes are a, a massive leap forward. Uh, in terms of trying to find the right balance between security and um, user experience. And uh, you know, I, I would call out and say that MBCO's trying to address all the challenges that are out there in the industry, same as you know, all the regulations um, that are upcoming on us, and it's definitely having a positive impact. That's really interesting. We've come a long way. Thank you so much for highlighting those. Uh, significant developments as well. So I'm interested to hear then, uh, what's the role of data science uh, around 3DS? And what are the key capabilities also that uh, ACS uh, should bring, deliver? Yeah, so you know, data science plays a, it's basically a crucial foundational pillar within an AC, a 3DS and ACS ecosystem. It leverages cutting edge predictive AI um, and state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm to really go through vast amount of data and risk assessing them in real time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, data science is where 
uh, we're trying to find the right balance bet between how much fraud we stop versus how do we minimize friction to the legitimate customers. Um, you know, it's about providing security, but also without compromising the ease of transactions when it comes to customers. Now, the best way to describe this is, let me give you an example on what we do at Outseer. Uh, that would help sort of signifies the important role that data science play is that, you know, say that we have an incoming transaction that needs risk assessing. Um, we would enrich that transaction with first party data, with third party data. We have a consortium of uh, bad entities, a database called consortium database, which is at a global level. So we have a consortium data coming through. Mm -hmm. We would then augment that transaction with the historical context. So now you'd see a massive data space with lots of data points, where data science plays a crucial role is to say, right, you know, out of the whole data space that I see that could have millions of different dimensions, I'm going to pick a few of them that are very relevant to the problem that I'm solving at hand. In our case, is the fraud detection, um, especially unauthorized fraud detection problem that we're dealing with. So you'll pick a certain data points that will pass through our machine learning platform for risk scoring. Now, on the back of that, we would see a score comes out on which that the business could decision upon. This decision could be to accept a particular transaction because we think it's safe, to step up a particular customer for additional authentication because we're not too sure what to mm -hmm. do it and how to risk assess this yet, or we can outright decline this particular transaction. So this decisioning has a profound impact on things like your interchange fees because if you stop a lot of bad, lot of good customers, you're not earning that interchange fees. But also, if you miss a lot of fraud, mm. then there are chargeback fees. Mm -hmm. And then there are fees related to collections and recovery. So by the time you finish, your fees mount up. And now you see the role <laughs> data science plays uh, in the whole of the ecosystem. I would also say that um, the role of data science not only going to get limited in the future to uh, what we do with transactions is going to, you're going to see that it's going to far outreach on the other capabilities. Uh, and that brings to the, your second question around what some of the ACS, what, what are some of the ACS capabilities uh, that we would have? And first and foremost, again, I would start by saying that uh, when you are a good ACS provider or, or a um, really good ACS provider, you're not just limiting yourself to saying, you know, I'm going to provide the best security but it's about finding the balance between security and uh, user experience. And to achieve that, you know, some of the key capabilities you need to have um, would be things like your risk engine. So you need to have a quite complex but real-time risk engine that's able to handle large amount of data, but also do prediction in real time. You need to have uh, orchestration capabilities and you can orchestrate either data or you can orchestrate either an authenticator. Mm -hmm. And we talked about earlier that you know, Visa and MasterCard are bringing additional authenticators and we need to be able to have a way of or a mechanism of uh, providing certain authentication challenges depending upon what the appetite is for an issuer. Um, I would also say that uh, having a good policy engine where business can write rules it's a, it's a huge benefit mm -hmm. and a case management functionality. So for any of those declined transactions that needs to be investigated, we need to have a case management capability to really look through those cases. So in a nutshell, I would say that you know, a, a good ACS solution is the one that can provide a, a very good, powerful risk engine has a ability to orchestrate uh, different signals uh, and, and authenticators and have the capability of case management and policy management. Combining all of these together, we'll be able to create a multi-layered defense approach against fraudsters. Right, well, that's a very positive note to end on and some very good advice weaved into your response there as well, Yogesh. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, I've learned a lot. You've explained that very well. Uh, and thank you. I look forward to touching Excellent. base with you next time. Thank you, Anna.